So um, condensing boilers and non-condensing boilers. Are, is there anything magical about a condensing boiler that makes it more efficient than a non-condensing boiler? No responses. Great. That's, that's an interactive crowd. That's right. He's got it. So a non-condensing boiler will condense no problem. And as long as you put cool, relatively cool water and the number's about 130 degrees, depending on humidity and barometric pressure and things, your dew point, and you can condense all day on a non-condensing boiler for about a day. And then it will eat itself up. So a condensing boiler is designed to withstand that condensate. And we'll get into details on to why that condensate can destroy a boiler. Um, the, the, the idea is you select your condensing boiler when your water temperatures warrant it. If you're going to send 130 degree water out to your building, choose a condensing boiler. If the water's going to come back to the boiler less than 130 degrees, choose a condensing boiler. And I'm not talking about just startup. I'm not talking about cold startup where, yeah, it's the ambient temperature, maybe 65 degrees, and the water's going to heat up to 180 degrees and then operate at 180, coming back at 160. That's not really a condensing boiler application. You won't gain efficiency points. You'll just spend a lot more money for your boiler. So the idea is your water temperatures determine whether you should use a condensing boiler or not. Um, we'll talk about outdoor reset where your water temperature has actually changed. You might design on your coldest day 180, 160, and on your warmer days you might be able to use 110 degree water to heat your building. You can save energy and utilize the efficiency points from a condensing boiler, but I do have a slide on that later. I just answered this question, right? Um, I answered this question already. It's similar to the condensate on that glass. It has to do with dew point and temperature. It's physics. It's not magic or uh, a trade secret on why a boiler condenses. Where does all the water come from? It comes from the natural gas. The reaction for natural gas is mostly methane, so that's why I'm showing methane in my formula here. And if we take methane and complete our fire triangle with oxygen and the heat, we can yield under our exothermic reactions carbon dioxide, water, and energy expressed here in kilojoules. So where does this water go? Well, generally it goes out the stack. On many boilers, up till the last decade or so, we designed our boilers and our flue system to send 17% of the heat we generate out the stack to give us the lift in order to vent our flue products safely from the building. Well, it's a ridiculous waste of heat when we don't need to waste all that heat just for our stack effect. So now we've added blowers to our boilers. I get those words, I said boiler to our blower. It's a, it's a, twink, a little bit of a tongue twister. We add blowers to our boiler to force the flue products out without relying on that energy from the buoyancy of the gases or hot air balloon effect. And we can put that heat into our system. And that's why we can get more efficiency out of our boilers in the last decade or two. So I mentioned the 130 degree number. That's kind of the number where we begin to form condensate in our boiler operation. This is the temperature returning to the boiler. Uh, so you could think of it as uh, return from the building, supply to the boiler. If it drops below about 130 degrees, condensation, that's about when it starts to form and rain inside the boiler. You may have heard that term before. And the, the condensate is corrosive. When you are changing phases, we can take advantage of what's called latent heat of vaporization. And you can uh, extract a lot of energy when you condense that steam or the gas. It's a water vapor. If we condense that to water, we can, that gives, that's going to give us heat energy. That gives us energy back. That's changing phases from steam to water. And that's why a boiler that condenses can be more efficient. Keep this guy. Keep that guy. Um, yeah, you're killing it over there. <laughs> but you get your own show, all right? Because this is my show. No, no. <laughs> Inter interject as at will. At, please do. Uh, and and we, we had a good conversation about um, uh, 
greater terminal temperature difference and lesser terminal temperature difference when you asked me last, last time I was here. And it ended up, we, we, well, how do you decide that? And that went really well. That's on video, by the way. I'm doing a YouTube channel, so you can check this out later. And you can even go back to the heat exchanger presentation that I gave a couple of months ago. Uh, when we're burning a million BTUs of gas, we can yield 95 pounds of water. There's quite a lot of moisture in that process. I've answered this too. Is a condensing boiler more efficient? Yes, if you're operating in condensing mode. Yes, a little bit if you're not. But it's, that's not, um, you're not going to get your return on investment if you don't condense the condensing boiler. That's the whole point. They do cost more money. Uh, condensate ends up with a pH of about between 3 and 4. I, I guess I forgot to put my units on the pH. No, there's no units for pH. So that was a trick question. It wasn't even a question. Um, it's carbonic acid, mostly. There's sulfur in natural gas, but traces amount, so you get a little sulfuric acid. But the main component of condensate is carbonic acid. Uh, like I said, the pH here, here's a, a case where there's a steel cover over this drain, and it's corroded away because of condensate. Uh, so we have, to handle, we have to deal with that condensate. A non-condensing boiler that's condensing is copper tube or steel, and that carbonic acid will eat away or eat into the materials of construction of that boiler. And that's why if you're going to condense, you need the condensing boiler because they're made of materials that withstand this carbonic acid corrosion. Uh, 